Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome back. It's my pleasure to be back with you uh, in the seventh session of the Mega Online course. Uh, Eid Mubarak for everyone here. May Allah accept uh, all the fast, all your fasting and prayers in the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, and I would like here to tell you that we're still working uh, temporarily from the social media platforms uh, as temporary uh, till we sort the technical uh, concerns. Uh, then we will be back uh, soon on the Zoom webinar setup plus the social media. Uh, so it's uh, the technical uh, support is happening in, in the background now. So allow me first of all uh, to introduce our very first eminent speaker today, Dr. Adel Hussein. Uh, Dr. Adel graduated from Cairo University Hospital in 1992. Uh, he earned his uh, master degree in critical care medicine in 1997 from Cairo University, followed by MD degree in critical care medicine as well in 2002. Uh, he is a former assistant professor uh, in Cairo University and he is uh, the um, uh, former director of critical care department in King uh, Abdullah Medical City, the holy capital, Saudi Arabia, and is currently ICU consultant in the same hospital. Uh, and our topic today with Dr. Adil is critical care. Uh, his, um, his critical care uh, topic, which is undifferentiated uh, shock, but the practical approach. So Dr. Adil, please go ahead. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. First of all, I have to thank the organizing committee for this meetings, regular scientific activities. Dr. Walid, Dr. Allah Khair, Dr. Sham, and the other district members for giving me this opportunity to be with with you. Uh, the uh, upcoming uh, 30 minutes, and I hope I can cover it uh, well. Uh, second, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept your fasting, your prayers, and uh, uh, Eid Mubarak, and make uh, uh, what you did in the holy month of Ramadan and your uh, good uh, deeds. Uh, my title, as uh, Dr. Walid uh, said now, is it will be a practical approach for uh, undifferentiated uh, shock. Uh, I have uh, nothing to disclose with my presentation. This is the outline of uh, my talk today. Uh, first, I will uh, highlight uh, some uh, pitfalls about shock in general. Uh, then uh, I will go through evaluating the causes or cause of shock Third, uh, we will highlight the uh, stabilizing approach uh, bedside. And finally, we will uh, sum up or wrap up, wrap up with uh, take home messages. Shock is extraordinarily important. Why? Because it's generally a final common pathway before death. So all roads uh, uh, went to Rome or led to Rome, so the shock, if left untreated, it will, of course, uh, lead to uh, mortality or death. Uh, so most of the serious diseases, uh, as we will see later, are capable of causing shock. Uh, as we mentioned, if, he, if left untreated, so shock will progress, of course, eventually to multiple mortality. However, shock, and after reversal, so usually we are working to uh, avoid uh, progressing to multi-organ failure and mortality. And we know that shock is about perfusion, not numbers, EP, not the production. Just assess your bedside in the ER, in the ICU, or in the floor for covering covering uh, a rapid response, for example. So always uh, you are facing a patient uh, with low perfusion, so do not rely only on numbers. So always assess for signs of adequate or inadequate perfusions. Like, for example, look for extremities, urine output, and mental status. And we will highlight this uh, with the next few slides. There's no sign, symptom, or lab request or lab workup, which is entirely sensitive for shock. Therefore, there is no single investigation. 
can explode shock. So usually we, we heard this two common statements from uh, your junior uh, staff or your uh, colleagues in, in, uh, in the department, in the ICU or in the team, that uh, Dr. Locke, the patient mentation was conscious level as well. So why cannot uh, or, uh, be in shock? Or the lactate is normal, I checked it in, in, in the blood gas or in the system, so as lactate is normal, so that it's blood shock. The patient is not shocked. Both statements are incorrect. And we will say why later. Patient and uh, desiderative shock may have normal blood pressure, particularly if they have chronic hypertension. So this is very important statement. Do not look for numbers, look for the baseline. So patient is uh, accustomed or uh, he is known to be uh, hypertensive. He is accustomed to be on a higher map. So uh, we will mention later, no single size will fetch all. So MAP 65 will not eventually uh, satisfy his major organs. Uh, MAP of 70 will not satisfy, for example, he needs higher MAP. So I will see this is also later. What's about the diagnostic algorithms? Uh, diagnostic algorithms for shock everywhere. If you go for the, uh, the articles, the updated guides, the uh, internet, so you will find definitely uh, textbooks, of course, you will find a lot of diagnostic algorithms. But remember very well that diagnostic algorithms for shock, it work best among patients with single disease process or previously normal. So when you will face patient with multifactorial shock or so-called mixed shock, this algorithm or these algorithms will not work well with you. Unfortunately, many patients have multifactorial shock or mixed shock on abnormal baseline. So as we mentioned, this simple algorithms or straightforward algorithms will fail these patients who are having multifactorial or many reasons for shock. Patients who have suffered cardiac arrest or post STEMI, uh, usually those patients, they have uh, a type of desiderative shock. Why? Because of the cytokine release or the systemic inflammatory response, or so-called now as CRS or cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm. So this type usually led to a confusing multifactorial picture when you will have a uh, uh, distributive shock plus the cardiogenic shock. And of course, this distributive shock will obscure primary the underlying problem, which is the cardiogenic shock with the pathology and different hemodynamic profile. The most common cause of shock of unclear etiology usually is septic shock. This is a, a common finding, but other causes should be carefully excluded prior to reaching an empiric diagnosis of septic shock. So you have to well on other types of shock. And when you are uncertain whether your patient has sepsis or not, also ask your patient how sick is. This is very important. Look for your patient how sick is hemodynamics, airway, meditation, and other stuff. So how sick to, uh, uh, your patient is, this is very important, is bit signed and you will go for assessment. And do not forget to evaluate the old archive or archival data, like old EKG, if a patient, for example, have an old MI uh, or bundle branch uh, block in the past, uh, images that the patient, for example, have ultrasound showing uh, gallstones, uh, previous history of, for example, surgery. So this is uh, very important. Uh, data for uh, delineating the uh, chronic pathology versus acute pathology you're facing that. Now, for the shock, we should have some red flags that it should points you that, uh, or should point you that this patient having either imminent shock or having already shock. So those red flags is very important because it raises for you the attention. For hemodynamics, usually, we are telling our colleagues, our juniors, trends will usually be more helpful than abnormal readings. Hypotension, which is MAP, uh, less than 65, or a significant drop, like 30 or 40, 
from baseline, this is also uh, uh, as a, a numerical definition. What about the shock index? As we know from previous uh, uh, article reviews, from previous evidence base, that the shock index is a useful way to understand the, the, the presence of tachycardia within the context of uh, the preparation. So it's a very simple tool. It's a bit sign, uh, triaging tool. Uh, you divide the, the heart rate by the systolic PP. So if you have uh, the shock index, which is more than equal or more than 0.8, this significantly uh, suggests instability and imminent or uh, possible shock. What about the bradycardia in the presence of, uh, uh, in the context of assisting shock patient? As we know that cardiac output is directly proportional to the heart rate. So severe bradycardia, what they mean by severe per heart rate, uh, for example, less than uh, 40 or 45, should always raise a concern of shock if you have other stigmata. Even if the blood pressure is maintained by the other compensatory vasoconstrictive mechanism to maintain the cardiac output, but still the cardiac output and perfusion will still uh, poor because there is other players in the game of perfusion. So bradycardia, which is severe less than 40, should raise your attention as a red flag. As I mentioned, this is a very important slide for you guys. If you would like to uh, go out with one important or some of the important slides from my presentation is to respect the shock index slide. Uh, this is the, the shock index uh, uh, equation, which is the heart rate divided by uh, systolic PV or systolic pressure. Uh, the, the normal uh, shock index is uh, less than 0.7. This is an, an general agreement about the, and this is from many uh, uh, reviews or many references. This is our reference for the shock index, less than 0.7. Just to, to go for my laser pointer here, I'm here. So this is usually the, the, the 0.7 type. Uh, what are the, the other two important numbers? If we have a shock index more than 0.8, so this predict a post intubation hypertension or crash if you are organic to uh, use rapid uh, sequence intubation. So for rapid sequence intubation, especially in ICU or in ER or in trauma, crashing units, you usually look for uh, the, the shock index. If more than 0.8, so this is a strong predictive uh, factor or tool or triaging tool for post-intubation hypotension. So you have to be ready uh, preemptively. If the shock, end sorry, shock index is more than one, so this is a very strong predictor with hyperlactic or for hyperlactitemia, and not only in hyperlactitemia, but also for 28 days mortality in ICU. So in, in, in shock index, usually we rely on as, as a secondary triage tool in mass casualty incidents. For example, uh, uh, now we are in the era of COVID-19, so it's a very helpful uh, uh, secondary triage tool to uh, before intubation or for uh, shock uh, in the ER or in the ICU before applying a hemodynamic uh, monitoring. So it's, uh, it's a very useful rule uh, or has a, a very useful rule in crashing patients for predicting the post-intubation hypotension, suspected sepsis, and uh, bleeding or trauma patients. Other red flags is a delirium. Uh, if you have a no answer delirium, uh, this is, can be a sign of shock. But remember, uh, it's neither uh, sensitive nor specific. Uh, but uh, some of the authors, they reported that if you have a no answer delirium, uh, this is uh, more common with septic uh, shock patients. Uh, for urine output, this is very important regarding dropping of their output below uh, 0.5. Uh, CC per kg per hour. So this is a inner perfusion sign. And not only the drop or the decline they are in output in the context or relating to the uh, body weight, but also is the color or uh, the dark urine. So it's scanty and dark urine. Uh, moving to the skin perfusion as a red flag, of course, cold the extremities are an early sign of basic constriction and reduced cardiac output. 
if all X derivatives are called this more specific for hyperperfusion, of course. So what's about the skin modeling? So skin modeling is less sensitive, but they found it's more specific for hyperperfusion, not only hyperperfusion, but also for high mortality. And this is our, the modeling staging score. And usually we use it uh, around the knee. So if uh, as you, you can see here in the, in, the, in the pictures, this is the diagram. If you go localized uh, at the knee, then you go outward to, up to the side up. So this is the severity from score one or stage one up to stage five. What about the capillary refill time? Capillary refill time also uh, during shock resuscitation or before starting uh, for shock assessment, they were found that is associated with uh, poor prognosis. So usually what we use for uh, capillary refill time, we use the index finger and we use also the knee capillary refill time. So what they found from the literature, they found that the index capillary refill time of around 2.5 and 2.4 to 2.5 seconds, and the knee capillary refill time around five uh, seconds. Do if you found that uh, during your assessment or station, they found it as uh, or are strong predictive factors for the 14 days mortality. So capillary refill time is a strong predictor, both at the index and the knee. So remember both, if you cannot measure it in the index and you can measure it in the knee and vice versa. Uh, remember it to, for, to be easy for, for all of us, 2.5 and the index and five second and the knee. And this is strong predictor of 14 days mortality. So for shock index is 28 mortality predictor if more than one. Capillary fill time is a 14 days mortality uh, for uh, in shock patients. Now, if you will ask me about the hemodynamics tool that we will use to assess or to monitor or to guide you, uh, honestly speaking, it's a buzz until now, till uh, May 2020. It's a hemodynamic, the hemodynamic, it's usually a buzzer. What does it mean, buzzer? Uh, a lot of, uh, of parameters, a lot of indices, a lot of tools, static dynamics, uh, sorry, static or dynamic indices, uh, but exactly the, 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 the link, which is the appropriate, the ideal tool, still we are missing. So what hemodynamic usually, uh, or what a hemodynamic monitor or tool uh, to solve your puzzle that you, you want it now? This tool usually uh, it should fulfill the follow, following criteria. It should be accurate in measurements, should be non-invasive as much as you can, simple, friendly to use, cheap at the same time, can, can be done anywhere, in the ER, in the ICU, bedside, in the floor, can be done anytime, which is more important, should be quick and reproducible. Uh, for example, now we are in the era of COVID-19, so we need a hemodynamic tool should be quick and also reproducible, either for diagnostic or for diagnosis to delineate the type of shock or to monitor your therapeutic interventions. So uh, what you have, this is, this is the, the idea. Now we, you have in the market, either in the, in the ICU or in, in, in your departments, or your unit, you have many hemodynamic uh, uh, monitors available to use it bedside. So what do you expect usually when you want to choose or want to use? Usually we want to expect from hemodynamic monitoring system, whatever the name, whatever the brand, is to measure the following three precisely and accurately. First is the cardiac output. I need the monitor to measure the cardiac output accurately. So I need something like Google the standard. If you remember in the past, we were relying on the swan gun catheter. So for measuring, for example, the, but it was invasive one. So now we need one tool is to measure the cardiac output more accurately compared to the gold standards. Second is to give me an idea or an answer for the very important question that we are uh, asking every day and night. Is my patient is fluid responsive or non-fluid responsive? Number three is to tell me when to stop my resuscitation, what we would call it resuscitation endpoints. So those are the three expectations from any hemodynamic tool. 
Moving now to, for evaluating the cause or causes of, of shock in crashing patients. This is the very or the most valuable uh, player in your game as to evaluate why your patient is shocked. Why is having a shock? Is it a single cause? Is it double? Is it multiple or multifactorial? Is it mixed shock? So uh, the, the, the management is different. So for example, this is uh, this patient is having uh, cardiogenic and septic at the same time. So for example, for, for, for the instant, your resuscitation uh, with fluid, it will uh, be different. So remember, uh, uh, this is very important. And uh, when you, you are dealing with, with shock, or dealing with crash, less is more because time is an important factor with you. So doing less, it, you will get uh, more. Uh, I'm not just uh, telling you do not do anything, but just be concise uh, in, in tailoring your uh, differential, broad, then come narrower and do less is more. Do not order a bunch of uh, investigation or lab work or images but at the end, you are not uh, using those. So be precise and uh, be uh, wise with your uh, uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, what about the role of, of lactate and central venous saturation in, in deaf and differentiated shock? Uh, we mentioned before, apps can always suggest shock, but never explode. Remember this very well. Regarding the lactatemia or high serum lactate, of course, lactate more than four suggests shock. Again, it suggests shock. But this has a broad differential diagnosis, for example, liver disease. But high lactate is worsened, of course. High lactate is worsened, of course, and should be interpreted to represent shock or some other impending disaster until proven otherwise. So if you have hyperlactatemia uh, uh, trending up uh, in, in the ER or in the ICU, it should worry you and it, you should treat it that there is an impending disaster until proven otherwise, as we mentioned. But again, on the other limb, normal lactate is not necessarily reassuring and it can occur also in the context of shock. Compared to uh, low central venous saturation or mixed venous saturation, if you, you are uh, having uh, swan gans, uh, so if you, if you know better than me that there's a difference between the central venous saturation, which is from uh, the central venous line from the right atrium, uh, compared to the mixed venous saturation, which is from the swan gans. So usually we, or, or commonly, or sometimes, we use it as a surrogate for the lactate or as a surrogate for endpoint resuscitation or as a surrogate for assessing the hypoperfusion. Uh, so it's used as a diagnostic for systemic perfusion, but they found it from uh, the evidence base a um, few years back that it has a poor correlation. So this, you're not, you would not rely only on central or mixed venous saturation or you want to rely only on hyperlactatemia because at the end, uh, some of them still, they, they are not ideal for using as uh, alone. Why we are telling that uh, it's undifferentiated shock? Uh, what does it mean when I ask in the round, uh, my colleagues, what does it mean the term of uh, undifferentiated shock? Why it came uh, uh, nowadays as a common term, which is the undifferentiated shock. So let's to define first that what does it mean shock and what does it mean undifferentiated? So the term will be complete as undifferentiated shock. So shock is a state of tissue hypoxia. Why? Because of reduced action delivery or increased oxygen consumption or inadequate oxygen utilization. This is the, the pathologic definition. Regarding numbers, there is a lot of literature that shock as systolic pressure, for example, less than 90 or MAP uh, less than, drop of MAP less than uh, 30 to 40 from the baseline. So this is an numerical definition, but this is uh, the pathological or pathophysiologic definition, which I like. So shock usually is the most commonly occurs when there is a circulatory failure 
manifest at hypotension. This is very important, and this is the definition or the numerical definition of hypotension. And as we mentioned before, in the pitfalls, look for the tissue perfusion signs, or look for the red flags, not only for the numbers. Look for the baseline for chronic hypertensive patients. So undifferentiated shock refers to or defines uh, the situation when the shock is recognized. Yes, the, your patient is shocked now with all the stigma of shock, but the cause is unclear. So this is why we call it undifferentiated shock. So shock is recognized, but the cause is unclear. For example, when you receive, if you compare it to histopathology exam of one of the tissues, so the histopathology will tell you undifferentiated malignancy or undifferentiated malignancy. So the cause is still unclear or unidentified. Commonly, we, we know the four types of shock, uh, the hypovolemic type, the distributive type, the cardiogenic type, and the obstructive. These are the common four. Hypovolemic uh, type, all of us, we know the hemorrhage or bleeding, the GI losses, dehydration, capillary leak. So this is the, the, com the common uh, etiologies for the hypovolemic shock. For the distributive shock, for of course, top of the list is the sepsis septic shock, the adrenal crisis, the post cardiac arrest, as we mentioned, because of the cytokine release syndrome, the anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, for people who are working in neurocritical care, this is very important. So it's a type of distributive shock. Cardiogenic, of course, top of the list is the MI, either type 1 or type 2, STEMI, heart failure, myopericarditis. Uh, and now we are in the era of uh, COVID-19, so there is uh, a subset of those patients present uh, to you with uh, cardiogenic shock second to myopericarditis or cytokine release syndrome uh, and also uh, detect sobo or stress-induced cardiomyopathy. It's a reason for cardiogenic shock. And this is can also in the context of septic shock. Obstructive uh, shock, of course, is the top of the list of the massive PE, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and acute core pulmonale. Uh, especially uh, if you have patient have uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, or uh, chronic pulmonary hypertension, uh, he's ventilated, or patient with ERDS and he develop uh, acute core problem because of uh, high P uh, uh, on the vent. So this is uh, the common four type. It's a very simple diagram, just to remind you, just to memorize. It, okay. Now, uh, before leaving the causes of shock, just I will highlight that. Don't forget that still we have a mixed type of shock. You can have two or more of those types. You can have uh, uh, cardiogenic or, or, or septic, both. You can have adrenal with uh, hypovolemic, uh, bleeding with uh, tamponade. So it's it, or it's obstructive. So you only have any type of uh, the mixed, any two types uh, of mixed shock. Uh, so you, you can uh, call it as a, like a mixture of shock. And for the other uh, entity, which is uh, very important for us in the ER and in the ICU, which is the post-intubation hypertension. So you have to predict, as we mentioned before, with using the shock index. So you have to be preemptively, plus you have to be preemptively ready to manage. So uh, those are the predictors or the causes for post-intubation hypertension. Uh, which is dehydration, beep effect uh, if the patient is ventilated, and of course the sedative effect if are using benzo, uh, like propofol, uh, dexo, methamidine, uh, and others. So usually uh, this is a sedative effect, commonly post uh, intubation. How you predict? As we mentioned, we have a strong predictive tool, which is the shock index. Uh, pins with cardiogenic shock, as I mentioned. Uh, earlier that post cardiac arrest syndrome or massive bleeding also have a distributive shock. We had cardiogenic shock at the end, uh, at other uh, arm, we have a, a type of distributive shock. Why? Because of the uh, systemic inflammatory response, the cytokine release syndrome, or and the visibility. So, here, uh, does one shock type exist in isolation? Sometimes. But more commonly, you will find now um, a mixed type of shock. They found that about 50% of patients with septic shock, they will develop cardiac dysfunction during the course. 
uh, so-called uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, like it's sobo, septic induced. There was not a small entity, about half of, of your patients, 50% of them, they will have mixed type of shock. Remember also very well, patients with hypotension and severe heart failure, may in fact, they are initially uh, volume responsive. They are in heart failure, severe advanced heart failure, but they are volume responsive. Why? Because they are suffering from uh, overdiuresis, uh, uh, occult bleed, OGI losses, diarrhea, vomiting. So those patients, they are, yes, uh, uh, they are in, in, in heart failure, but at the end, the volume uh, responsive. Now, moving forward, the, the, the third part of my talk, which is the destabilization approach. So if I'm, 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 I'm planning to uh, have an idea what's going on with my patient, so I have to have an, a simple approach that it should work with every patient coming to the ER or in your ICU developing uh, uh, undifferentiated hypotension or shock, or you are assessing him in the floor uh, if you are covering, for example, uh, the rapid response team. So starting very simple from uh, skin perfusion as a clinical assessment, look for uh, the monitor for the vitals, is there narrow pulse pressure? Uh, this is usually suggest a low cardiac output or wide pulse pressure. This is usually suggest a, a high output uh, shock or for example, a septic shock. So this is very important data when you suggest numbers here uh, uh, from the monitors. From the perfusion, calmities, perfusion, skin modeling, as I mentioned, capillary refer time, this is data can you grasp it early and bedside. Then you use your tools, either uh, the point of care ultrasound, uh, I will mention uh, later in, in the coming few slides. So here, do not forget, you are a physician, you are a bedside uh, judge, I call it bedside judge. So before using your uh, stethoscope or sonoscope, as it be called, use your clinical judge and clinical assessment and figure out earlier than when you put your, for example, uh, your probe or uh, the sonoscope, uh, your, your tool to, to manage, then you will figure it earlier. And this is the area of uh, uh, interest of area of concentration. So this is a, a, a bedside shock evaluation how you will, will use it. So uh, if you, you, you will use the echo assessment, for sure you will come up with an uh, assessment uh, tool that will help you with the cause of shock. For lung as well, you will come up with uh, a modality which is, uh, we are in need for now every day and night, and it's uh, non-invasive and precisely can assess what's underlying and what's going on. For, uh, for the abdomen itself, uh, for example, if I think the AFAS protocol, again, you can highlight if you are working in a trauma center. So this is will help uh, you for assessing the shock. So if you are facing now patient with shock, so collaboratively from the physical exam, a monitor uh, assessment and EKG, then moving for the diagnostic non-invasive tools, with the echo uh, uh, or point of care ultrasound, for sure you will come up with the cause or bedside underlying assessment why my patient is shocked. So now we are incorporating uh, all in one package, with the physical exams and certain investigations uh, like your monitor AKG and some bedside diagnostic tool, which is less invasive or non-invasive like the point of care ultrasound. Now, moving for the point of care ultrasound, which now is implemented in uh, ER or ICU, or even now we have it in, on, on, on certain institution on your mobile phone that you have the probe and you, it's connected now to your, your smartphone. So it's, it's easy now to have the point of care ultrasound uh, in your unit, uh, it will be very helpful, especially for crashing patients. And I will mention uh, 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 what are the protocol usually we use uh, for uh, dilating the cause of shock and monitoring uh, your patient uh, for uh, therapy. So uh, five minutes behind time. Sorry for interruption. Okay, so I will uh, I will just move faster for uh, the common protocol that we use it. 
uh, for deleting shock patient, which is the RUSH protocol. It's a common protocol, very famous one, which is the rapid ultrasound uh, in hypotension uh, protocol, usually with the pump, tank, and the pipes. Those are the three. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, how can we, uh, we, we go through the four types of shock as through assessing the pump, which is the contractility, assessing the tank, which is the IVC, then and assessing the, the pipes, which is the uh, aorta and the, the, the DVT and the lower extremities. Uh, there is another protocol which is the, for uh, guiding you with fluid assessment. We call it uh, false protocol. And this is the delineation uh, through using the point of care uh, ultrasound. So of course, the rush and the, uh, the, the false uh, are uh, both point of care ultrasound you use it to delineate the common type of the obstructive cardiogenic hypovolemic and the dissipative uh, shock so if I, i'll ask you how many patients in 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 the icu are fluid responsive uh, just if you can guess a number uh, they found that uh, uh, 52 up to 52 of your of, uh, icu patients they are uh, fluid responsive and this is uh, uh, an old study by uh, John Topol uh, in 2002. So more than 18 years now, uh, it's very clear that 50 up to 52 of your patients are fluid uh, responsive. And on the other hand, 48 of them are uh, not fluid responsive. Remember this well. And now uh, uh, regarding the, the international guidelines uh, as an evidence for us, all of these guidelines from 2016, 2019, 2020, the or are recommending using the dynamic over static indices for assessing fluid responsiveness. What about these, those dynamic indices for fluid responsive? We have two uh, major indices. One in these, or one index is to, or, or, uh, to assess the heart line interaction. This is usually in, or mainly in mechanical ventilated patients. Passive leg raise or PLR, this is both. You can use it in spontaneously breathing patient and mechanically ventilated patients. This is for what's called dynamic indices. So this is the list of the dynamic indices. Forget about the brand names, but now this is the mechanism for the dynamic parameters, either for uh, SPV, which is the systolic pressure variation, or PBV, pulse pressure variation, or SVV, stroke volume variation, or uh, bellicosmic variability in this index. This, these is, are the, the, the brand name, forget about the brand name, whatever uh, your, your ICU, what is using, but this is the mechanism. And as intensivists, you should be aware how it works, at least the bath physiology or the physiologic or the physics background behind the, the, the mechanism. So uh, uh, regarding uh, one of the important uh, dynamic parameter we use for fluid responsive in mechanical ventilated patient, which is the pulse pressure variation. So the cut value of pulse pressure variation 10 to 15% usually predicts the fluid responsiveness. More than 10% the patient is fluid responsive, less than 10% your patient is not fluid responsive or less fluid responsive. You need only the arterial line. From the arterial line, you can get the uh, PP max minus the PP minimum, divided by the mean and you get uh, uh, the, the, uh, the BB uh, or the pulse pressure variation. But remember this, it works mainly uh, with accurate as, uh, or high sensitivity and specificity reaches 90% in mechanical ventilated patients. Uh, usually eight ml per kg tidal volume, they should be paralyzed or passively breathing and the, it works well in the absence of cardiac arrhythmias. So, uh, uh, it has, as I mentioned, a certain limitation, uh, which is the pulse pressure variation. Uh, the patient should be ventilated, uh, passively uh, breathing, and no cardiac uh, or isn't silent rhythm. Uh, there is an, another tool we use it uh, frequently in the bedside, which is the index paratri occlusion test, and uh, also the tidal volume uh, challenge. And this is a very unique test. Uh, you measure the tidal volume uh, uh, at six and eight, then you use the delta, uh, uh, and it's very helpful in the absence of cardiac output monitoring. So if you, you don't have any cardiac output monitoring, you can use for vented patients the delta B, delta BBV at eight, at six, then at eight ml per kg, then the cut value of uh, 3.5. So if 
more than four. So this is a very uh, strong predictor that your patient is very small. We call it, uh, uh, in comparison to fluid challenge, we call it tidal volume challenge. And this is the basal uh, leg raise test. And the basal leg raise, it should be combined with a, a tool that you can assess uh, a cut value for fluid responsiveness and uh, you cut the output monitoring. Either I mentioned stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, or cut the output. So P PLR alone is not helpful, but PLR with uh, a tool that it will tell you uh, a target for uh, volume responsiveness, this is very important and this is, will be the helpful tool. And uh, uh, remember that assessing fluid responsiveness, it should tell you a tool about RV and uh, yeah, the, the ideal one is, as I mentioned, PLR. Uh, with the flow challenge or the end expiratory or tidal volume because it's telling about both preload and afterload. Other parameters, either indices, uh, either telling you about the RV alone or LV alone. Uh, if your patient is fluid responsive or not, this is just a very simple diagram uh, which to use uh, if your patient uh, ventilated or spontaneous breathing, what tool should you use? and what, how can you uh, tailor uh, your fluid responsiveness tool and what's the target. Uh, these are some hemodynamic management. Remember that less is more common shock pathologies uh, hate liberal fluid resuscitation. Be restrictive as much as you can slow it, but at the same time be prudent. Use the balanced crystallites over unbalanced. Don't follow the so-called lack Bolus, what lack bolus? High lactate means high fluids, so uh, fluid bolus. No, just be uh, uh, wise with assessment. Why your patient is having lactate, hyperlactatemia? So not every patient have hyperlactemia needs fluids. So don't follow this uh, with each patient or with every patient. To just be wise, and remember that uh, same fluid blanket does not fit all. Uh, for morbidly obese patients, uh, what we use ideal body weight. For uh, the uh, predicted, uh, predicted by the weight or the actual by the weight. For example, now surviving sepsis campaign is telling you give 30 ml per kg. So this per kg is not suitable for all patients. What are they telling you? What about morbid obese patients? What about endocrine renal failure? What about patients with massive PE? You are giving 30 ml per kg? No, of course not. So remember that the fluid blanket does not fit all. Be always goal directed with fluid res uh, resuscitation. What what does it mean fluid? Uh, what does it mean goal directed? Use uh, dynamic variables or dynamic indices in your hand. The most available in your hand. Use it, please. Do not look for the advanced uh, tools if you don't have. Use the PLR, uh, the trends in, in the vitals, uh, if you even dynamics, uh, echo point of care ultrasound. Do fluid challenge to avoid fluids when no benefit, of course. The last word is not yet said, dry and vasopressors. Uh, Many patients, they may develop AKI, multi-organ failure, and vasopressors, of course. In fact, they could benefit from broadened. Remember the word broadened, broadened flow uh, resuscitation. These are the, the guidelines as I opted for you for uh, the, the, the recommendations about using the vasopressors. But just more important, uh, the, the MAP target 60 to 65, as I mentioned, is not a blanket for all. One side does not fit all. Just remember people who like uh, higher MAP, people with chronic hypertension, they like MAP 70s and 80s, what's their previous MAP? So <clears throat> for example, uh, recommendation, it comes from a surviving sepsis campaign, but again, you are bedside and you are the one who are assessing your patient. In those guidelines, is not a holy Bible, it guides you. Um, I just, I will uh, end my talk with just uh, two important slides, which is the resuscitation endpoints. Usually when to stop your resuscitation, it's a dynamic process. You start it, it's an easy, but when to end, this is the, 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 the pearl. So use the, the all or uh, uh, the whole package. Use global assessment and under, uh, in the organ assessment. Use dynamics and static if you have both. So, and uh, maintain scan perfusion, pulse pressure, uh, sorry, heart rate, pulse pressure trend, the shock index, the urine output. This is as, as a global, specific wise, go for serum lactate and uh, pH, the base deficit, point of care ultrasound targets and goals, uh, uh, PPV uh, waveform. 
and if you have other dynamic indices. So this is the, are the endpoints that will tell you when exactly to stop. So do not, uh, please do not rely only in one uh, tool that, okay, his uh, urine output now is okay, uh, or his BP is okay, or the heart rate is rending down. No, it's a global assessment. Uh, uh, now I will just wrap up with uh, take home messages. So please guys uh, and colleagues, be aware about the common shock pitfalls I highlighted in the beginning of my presentation. Uh, diagnostic algorithms, as we mentioned, for shock work best among patients with single disease paralysis who were previously normal. It don't work with, uh, well with mixed type of shock. Uh, why then in diagnosis, uh, like you are winning your antibiotics coverage? The same. Why then your definition diagnosis or you're facing patient with shock and do not mix it? Uh, uh, don't, uh, don't, 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 don't mess the mixed shock uh, state, which is really not uncommon. High index of suspicion for uh, cytokine release syndrome, the myopericarditis, and pulse intubation hypotension. Remember very well, not all S segment elevation is a STEMI. Uh, think about myopericarditis. Uh, if the patient uh, is, is coming to you with uh, a, a picture that may obscure the, the, the STEMI. A goal of resuscitation is to maximize the survival and to minimize morbidity. Why? Because this is your, 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 uh, your, your goal. How you use it? Using the objective or dynamic hemodynamics uh, variables and the physiologic variables to guide your therapy. The first few hours of resuscitation are vital. Please be goal directed with fluid resuscitation. As I mentioned, PLR, the uh, vital trend or the change in the vital trends. Point of care ultrasounds is very important. Till now, there is no therapeutic endpoint is universally effective and accepted. Package is not is not single tool. So use package as I mentioned, global and then normal. I remember at the end, less is more, and the same fluid blanket will not or does not fit all. And the end, the end, be wise, be broadened. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Adel Hussein, for this uh, comprehensive uh, topic. I know how difficult to cover such a huge topic in, in 30 minutes. Uh, shock is uh, one of the cornerstones in the management in ICU, the same as ARDS.